Hello, hello. Password is um, eBay guest, and then we have um, buy it now exclamation, and B, I, and N is all capitalized. Yep, got it. Okay, all right, well, welcome. All right, so uh, exciting day for, uh, for Joomla, exciting day for all of us. Um, I think uh, for many of us who've been in Joomla for, boy, now uh, since 2007 for me, um, this is like a long time coming. I mean, you know, since Denver, I think back in 2008, I went to Denver and I went to the CMS, uh, what, what was considered back then the Joomla CMS Expo, and now it's the CMS Expo. Um, I think we've been waiting for the three-day event, and now we finally have it right here at eBay, so I'm really excited about that. So, um, so let's go ahead and get started. We got 50 minutes, and uh, we're going to cover a lot of things in that short time. And um, I'm hoping that, there we go. So I'm going to jump in, literally. And uh, so I'm just going to play a little video. I think here. I'm going to jump a little over here because I think yeah. I'll get a little, uh, OK. All right, we got James okay. going for the big jump. Yeah. yeah. Okay, go for it. Go. <laughs> oh, shit. Whoa. <laughs> OK. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, so we're going to jump in, and, and that's what we're doing here at Joomla. And this is when I was in Vermont, and um, I brought this video in because in Vermont, of course, we had a really great snow year that year. And that was the year that I started uh, with Joomla and uh, literally jumped off the cliff into uh, building my own templates right away. Um, I found out quickly that that was uh, probably not the right way to start with Joomla, was to you know try to figure all that out. So. Um, so I jumped in, and uh, now I'm in the Bay Area. I'm here in San Francisco. And uh, let's see if we can get this going. Come on. Okay. There we go. Oh. What I'm doing is I'm using Google Drive slides for the first time. And I'm noticing that I can't use the remote control on that. So I'm, I'm kind of improvising here a little bit. Um, OK, so I. Uh, I graduated college in 1995, and I went right out of college and said, I don't, don't want to work for anybody. I want to work for myself. I started a business. I was actually a chef. Um, I still do that sometimes. And um, so in 1995, my wife and I came together. We started a business, and we got rolling right away um, with how to learn kind of the hard way, you might say, in the beginning, um, how to run a business, how to uh, how to get clients, how to keep them, and so on. And then in 1998, we were up in the Napa Valley, and of course, everybody was building websites back then, and uh, everybody thought they knew what they were doing. And, and I hired a design company, and we jumped right in. We literally uh, we had had uh, a five-page HTML-based site for $5,000 developed uh, with a whole brand and everything, and. That website, which I will show you in a little bit, is still running today. It's, um, it's an advertising portal, and that's what got me into Joomla back in 2007. Um, I had to migrate that site into a directory portal, and uh, I use Sobe, uh, Sobe 2, which is now Sobe Pro and so on. And so if anybody's uh, experience with Sobe, that's what, how I got started. Um, so in 2000, I started my uh, began web services company. Um, then in 2001, I uh, created a niche in SEO and internet marketing, and I did that for a number of years. And um, jumped right in, moved to Vermont because um, things were going well, and I was up in Sonoma County, which is north of here, if anybody doesn't know. Um, and it was going well, and we thought, hey, you know, let's try out winter. Let's see what winter's like. So we went to Vermont. And what I didn't know at that time was that Joomla is big in Vermont, um, very big. And uh, you'll see Andrea Tarr, who's from Vermont, um, New England. Um, it's, it's one of the biggest CMSs around. And uh, unlike here, where we get a lot of Drupal folks, you know, giving us uh, a bunch of garbage about how bad Joomla is, in the Northeast, Joomla rules, at least in the, the, the areas that I was in, uh, Joomla ruled. So, it was awesome with Jen Kramer and everybody else to be able to, to leap into Joomla and learn things really quickly. So, And then um, uh, you can see here I did the portal directory in Sobe. Came back uh, to the Bay Area in 2009 and um, have been you know, having a great time with Joomla ever since. And um, the biggest piece, and I'm going to talk about this a little later, the biggest piece to my success here in the Bay Area has been the Joomla users group. Because 
Um, they needed somebody to help organize things. Uh, they actually, I, I did a presentation back in, I think it was 2009, I'd been here about a month, and I did one on Sobe, and that presentation actually was found on Google throughout the world, and uh, within about three or four months, I had clients from Mongolia and, and all kinds of places asking me, hey, can you do a directory for me? Can you do this? Can you do that? So um, that was a really uh, big step in the process for myself as a freelancer here in the, in the Bay Area. Um, trying to move away from that. So uh, since we're at the beginning of the conference and we're also, you know, in your first session, um, and this kind of goes hand in hand with what I'm going to talk about today, um, because after 15 years of uh, being a freelancer in some form, um, the, the very first step is the intentions that you bring to what you do. So, um, so I think, you know, just take a minute if you haven't already and think about, you know, what intention do you want to, uh, to achieve today, just today? Um, let's not, you, you can think about the whole conference, but what, what's, what's happening today for you? Um, just take a second and think about that. We don't have a lot of time. Um, and then the second one is, what do you want out of this session here? Um, and if anybody has something that they're, you know, kind of itching for or want to focus on, um, does anybody have anything surrounding freelance or anything that comes up just off the top of your head? What that might be, could you say it if you do? Do you have anything that comes about that you want to like cover, that you want to know about? Anything? Okay, good, because then I can cover it. Yeah, what do you got? Okay. Okay. So how, are we, how do we deal with clients in a, uh, in a way when it comes to migration or upgrading the site? Okay, good one, good one. Okay, so I'm going to cover that a little later. Um, and that has been, uh, 2012 has been uh, the year of migration. I mean, it's, it's been a pretty intense road for, for me this year. So, um, so think about what your intention is for today because it's going to help you as you go through your day and so on. So um, I'm kind of calling what we're going to go over the path of freelance. Now, one of the things that helps me through my day is I'm, uh, I practice Zen Buddhism, so um, I meditate every morning when I get up. I, um, I go to the Zen Center. I'm seven blocks from the San Francisco Zen Center. So that helps me free my mind and come up with ideas so that when I go to work, I'm ready to go at 9 o'clock, and when somebody calls and if there's a problem, if something comes up, I can use that practice to kind of uh, integrate into my work. So I call it the path of freelance because really that's what it is. It's an organic process. You know, being a freelancer is something that changes all the time. I have gone through about five or six different iterations of being a freelancer in the last 10 years alone. So I've had to kind of reinvent myself uh, a bunch of times. Um, so we're going to start, start off with how do you define your business, your niche, or your, uh, or your intentions? How do you set your intentions? Uh, structure, what, you know, based on who you are. Um, each one of us is completely unique and different. Uh, in fact, each client is so different that sometimes it's, it's challenging to be myself. <laughs> I mean, there's, uh, I was just hired for a job down here in Silicon Valley from, uh, that's a subsidiary of Boeing. And they're changing their entire culture uh, right now, and that's a, a big step in the process, even with their website. So who, who are you? And the marketing, networking, expanding piece, that's, um, that's the one thing that when we get up from our desks at 5 o'clock or 7 or 1 in the morning, um, it's kind of going through our head always, you know, what are we going to do from a marketing standpoint, networking, and so on, because we don't always have the time. I'm going to go through some of that. And then how do we keep ourselves relevant? So that's where the sustainability comes in. Um, I've had to kind of reinvent myself over these years because what I was doing wasn't relevant anymore. It maybe wasn't relevant to me as a person, as a, as a developer, as a creator, or it wasn't relevant to, um, to the technology. Uh, you know, back 11 years ago, developing in Dreamweaver was fine. You could do that and you could make good money. If you developed in Dreamweaver today, you're going to be very, very limited, as you probably know. So none of this is possible without discipline, determination, talent, and personal care. I'm going to go through each one of them. Um, 
Now, this is kind of the fun part. You know, what is a freelancer, really? I mean, when you say you're a freelancer, uh, some people might say independent contractor. They might say, uh, you know, subcontractor is another word. It might be, it, it, it really depends, I mean, who you ask, what they say when they are defining what a freelancer is. Um, this graphic that you see here, this is from 24-7. Uh, um, it's uh, 247talent.com. And uh, these guys put together uh, earlier this year um, a, an entire uh, analytics of freelancers. I mean, they asked a whole bunch of freelancers from all over the United States, and I think they went into other countries, I'm not sure, and asked them, you know, what is it about being a freelancer? What, what are you, why did you become a freelancer? Uh, uh, what do you hope for? What, what are your challenges? And so on. And some of the things that they came up, and you can see this, and I, I've, this link, I would go to it, but we don't have a lot of time. This graphic right here is great. They have it in poster form on their website. And basically it talks about how, you know, most of us want flexibility. We want to control our work environment, where we work, you know, who we work with. Um, we want, uh, you know, we want to be able to charge what we're worth. I think that's one of the main reasons why I do what I do is that, you know, I found um, that in the, in the workforce, I couldn't charge and sometimes make what I make today. Um, and then, and it kind of talks about it up here. There's a bunch of different, like, scenarios of what, what makes it. And the first, the number one thing is flexibility. The number one thing that, that a person becomes a freelancer for is flexibility. And that's really what has been great about my life as a freelancer. I've been able to live in, uh, since technology, five different states. I've lived in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Vermont, California, Wyoming, and so on. And so, and, and I've done that because I, I wanted to, and I could. Um, and I'll tell you why and how I got there. But um, the top three issues um, are sleeplessness, you know, is one of them. Uh, for sleeplessness is it, that keeps them sleep, sleepless is professional, professionally relevant, meeting deadlines, lack of clear direction. Is anybody familiar with all this stuff? Um, some of my best designs happen at about 11 o'clock when I'm trying to fall asleep. But unfortunately, sometimes I don't fall asleep till 1 a.m. Um, even, even last night, I mean, I've done presentations uh, for the last five years, a lot of them. But my mind was, was going because I was thinking, wow, who am I going to meet and what's going to happen? And, and uh, it, it was just, you know, it took me a while to fall asleep last night. But that's, you know, that's what keeps us awake is as a freelancer, you have to be willing sometimes to do what it takes. And you can't always leave your work, uh, your, your work um, at the workplace. Now, some of us work at home. Um, I don't. I work at a co-working space. But it's really difficult to go home and just turn it off. So how do, how do we work with that? I'll be talking about that later. The satisfaction meter. Okay, so this year, the people that they surveyed, 62% say they're going to do better this year. Um, now, one of the things in our political scheme was, are you better four years, uh, were you better, are you better off now than you were four years ago? It's a big, you know, Reagan re uh, Republican idea. And they wanted to put that out there. And, you know, me personally, four years ago when the collapse happened, it hit me hard. I mean, I was in Vermont and a lot of my clients who were on the West Coast, just some of them ceased to exist. Um, they didn't pay. They didn't want to pay. They couldn't pay. Um, I had to scramble. I had to like make some really hard choices. I had to cut up my credit cards. I had to pay down debt. It was a difficult time. Right now, it's probably the best it's been in 15 years, um, easily. But this year alone, I think I doubled what I did last year. Um, in the first six months in particular, it was the busiest as I've ever been. Um, so. This year is a good year, and, and compared to the 55% say that this year will be a better year financially in the workforce itself. So there are people that they surveyed in the workforce as well. And there are people who are saying, yeah, it's getting better, getting better for me. You know, people who are working here in Silicon Valley, some of them are still laid off, um, but it, it's getting better for them. Okay, so defining your, your business niche. Um, like I said before, you know, it's an organic process, and what that means is, is that something comes along, a client calls you for, let's say you've never done an e-commerce site, and they say, well, you know, I need an e-commerce site, and 
you know, willing to spend and all this stuff. And it's like, well, hmm, maybe I need to go into e-commerce. Maybe that's something I want to do. So it's an organic process. You, you have these decision points along the way. But really, you have to ask yourself, who am I and how do I want to work? Um, because the thing is, is that might not be a match. That person who called you with the best possible project you've ever seen may not be the match for you. And, and how do you determine that? Well, you have to look at who you are. Who are you? Well, um, you know, what's funny uh, is uh, yesterday I had a new client who, who, who gave me a description of how he thought I was over the last month or so which is completely different than what I thought of myself as being. It was, it was interesting. So af even after 15 years, I get this feedback. It's like, really, they perceived me as that? Really? Wow, that's amazing. Um, and it wasn't necessarily positive feedback. I had, to, I had to listen to that. But who are we really? You know, do we want to, for example, take more than one vacation a year? Do we want to be able to, um, to have enough money for our, our um, kids to go to college. You know, I have a I have a 25-year-old who's in college right now. Believe it or not, I'm 45, but my wife is a little older, so we have a 25-year-old and we had to make some choices that had to do with who we were, who we became as he got older. So that was a big big uh, part for us. Um, so setting those intentions and what we did what I did was I said, well, when I came back to the Bay Area, I said, I've got to do things differently. And that's what I did, and, um, and we'll go into that. But by establishing your qualities and, your dif and, and how you differentiate yourself, you can actually discover things about what you do and who you can work for that might surprise you, OK? Um, so for example, you know, you re really listening and finding out what your personality is and how you work. If you're a person who's not really into talking and communicating with people much, you'd really would rather be at the computer and, and doing development work, then that's going to uh, determine, you know, what kind of jobs, what kind of projects you're going to take. Um, I'm the kind of person who likes to do both. I like to do the work at the computer and I like to be the technician, but I also like to go to the client, sit down with them and say, okay, so what are your goals? What do you want to achieve? Do you want to double your traffic? Do you think that's realistic? And so on. So. Um, so that's my personality. Um, some of these things I'm talking about are in your brand. This is going to be how you're going to brand yourself as a uh, freelancer. So style, colors, and brand. I've always loved blue, so I use blue in a lot of what I do. If you get my card today, you'll see that it's blue. My, my website has a lot of blue on it. Um, and actually, when I wear blue, I look good in blue, so it seemed to make sense. Um, so then, you know, where is your passion? For me, it started in the retreat and conference industry. So um, I went to where that began was I was in England uh, 22 years ago, and I went to a conference. I went to a, a retreat, actually, uh, in Findhorn in Scotland. And I, and I had such a great experience. I was like, I want more of that. I, I want to do that. I want to be around these kind of people. I want to find out about conference and retreat centers and see what they're all about. So I came back here to California, which is the center of the retreat world. And in the 90s, there was a lot of money. There was a lot of new centers being built. There was, you know, a lot of people writing books and saying that the world's going to end or it's going to continue on. And um, we made a business out of it. We, we, uh, we cooked for groups. We, um, then a lot of these facilitators said, hey, well, where can we bring our group? You know? And we were like, well, we've cooked at 15 different places. Let's start a website. And so we started a website called All About Retreats. It's, an, it's a niche market. We got it to the top of the search engines back then. That was before Google. So we got, we got it into uh, Alta Vista, if anybody remembers Alta Vista. Uh, <laughs> we got it to the top of that. And then when we hit the top of Yahoo, we got 40,000 visitors a month. It was like, wow. Oh my god, we're off to the races. And till this day, this, that website makes great advertising money for us. My wife spends about two hours a week on it. So in a given year, she spends two hours a week. It brings in, you know, a modest forty or fifty thousand dollars a year, just that one website. And we branched out and we did other things, but that that led into the network we created from there. Um, corporations, people who who ran these retreat centers were mavericks, and some of them owned corporations, uh, Thorlow Socks in North Carolina and some of these others. And so we branched out, and that's how I got into the web business in 1998. We uh, 
we started developing sites for these retreat centers, and then it's kind of led into we don't really do much with it anymore. We don't do much in that in that area. Um, but we also got to go on retreat, you know, sometimes for free. We got to do things we like to do. It was our style of life. So um, that made a big difference. Um, okay, so I'm going to kind of pass through this because we're, we're moving on time here. Is, um, so in, in relation to this is dressing the part, living, you know, who you are. Um, I like to kind of dress with nice shoes and so on. So, you know, my going downtown and working in San Francisco just fits who I am. But I talk to people all the time who say, well, you know, I, I work at home and I love it. You know, and that's great. I, I can just work in my pajamas or whatever. Um, well, that's fine, but you know, it worked for me because when I came to, <laughs> to San Francisco and I work, I work at a co-working space called Next Space, um, I started making connections just by sitting next to somebody and, and um, I would hear conversations about new mobile apps and stuff. Um, and then it was like they would have this question about something and I would say, well, maybe you guys want to use Joomla, you know, maybe, you know, a new startup would come into our co-working space and I could, you know, interact with them and I would learn new things and they could learn from me. So that made a big difference. Um, and like I said before, you know, I created a niche and I always encourage developers, designers to create a niche. If you love, uh, one of the things I do as a hobby is birding. You know, if you were a birder, if you loved a bird, um, create a niche, maybe a website in your area that would be about birding, a blog or something. You never know, because it might bring in advertising dollars. And that's what I did. I, I do these sites so that I can bring in advertising dollars so that when a new client comes to me, I can say no. You know, right now, this is our year, this is our time of year where we bring in the, the, the advertisers. I could say, no, I don't think I want that project. I want to have more of a Christmas vacation or whatever. You know, I can, I can hang out and I can wait for the next project. So developing a niche will help you do that. Now, striving to be diff, different. Um, it's really, I think being different is really noticing what's around you. Um, in San Francisco, uh, every day I see something different. Uh, orange hair, purple hair, pink hair sometimes. Sometimes it's a, it's a tattoo in an area I'd never seen before. Um, <laughs> but uh, these people are striving to be different. I'm pretty plain. I was born in Minnesota, you know, kind of grew up the Scandinavian. You know, it's not, so, tattoos aren't my thing. Um, but in Joomla, I could, be, I could be different and I could be part of a community. Different in the sense that you know, maybe I can communicate a little more than some of the other tech folks, so I could get out there and I could, uh, you know, I could kind of, you know, rub elbows with people in a way that maybe somebody else couldn't. Um, and uh, that made a difference. So, so strive to look for different, different things, new avenues. Um, and befriending your competition. So one of the things that I do is I speak at these conferences where Drupal people are and WordPress folks. And some of them will get up there and they'll say, well, Joomla sucks. And I'm like, uh, you know, now hold on a second here, <laughs> you know. Um, and I will go up to him. In fact, just the other day, somebody at NextSpace posted this thing, this rant about why he hated Drupal and, and Joomla. And everything he listed was something that somebody new to Joomla would have said about it. Well, it's hard. It takes up so much CPU, blah, blah, blah. And I emailed him back and I, you know, I responded back to him and I said, well, you know, it depends on your situations. It depends what kind of developer you are. Maybe WordPress is your thing. Great. Wonderful. Um, but I befriended him and I said, hey, you know, come, come and check out Joomla sometime. We have a, we have a meetup uh, group here in San Francisco. Come check us out, you know, and maybe if you're having an event, we'll come to yours as well. Because befriending your competition, a lot of people don't think of that. But I'll tell you, that has brought in a lot of projects for me over the years. Okay, so I'm going to move on through. Got lots to talk, tackle here. Um, how much time do I have, by the way? What are, where are we at? Okay, good, good. <sighs> okay, each step coming back to the basics. Okay, another thing that I did when I was younger, and I've done a lot of different things, as you will hear, um, is I did a lot of dance. So actually, my degree, believe it or not, is in modern dance. I was a modern dancer here in the Bay Area. I, was, I did ballet. I did all those things. Um, and I loved it. You know, I, was, uh, I, I did well with it. And it just, you know, I didn't want to move to New York City. I didn't want to live in New York City. So I chose not to dance any longer. But one of the things that we, had to, we have to do as dancers is we got to go back to the basics. You got to go back to what, you know, the pole. You know, if you're a ballet dancer, if you forget the basics, 
you're gonna you're basically probably never gonna be the ballerina you want to be if you're gonna be a ballerina or never gonna be that dancer or that choreographer that you want to be if you forget the basics so um, Examining yourself in all ways, and that's what I do as a um, somebody who practices Zen. Um, you know, we sit. Some people are wondering why do you sit and face a wall? You know, because that's what we do. I mean, our meditation in Zen is you sit and you face a wall. But facing that wall, it's amazing what comes <laughs> up. First of all, um, and it, you examine. You're examining yourself. And when we're sitting at that computer and we're all like off in some other world. It's amazing the difference it is when you notice the little things. And I'm talking about the pixels on the page and the, the code. If I'm doing code and I walk in the door and my mind is racing in five different directions, I can't do code. I can't figure out what it is that I'm going to achieve for that, for that day. Um, okay, so when, when successful. Okay, so you know, if you're successful at something, branch off into another area. You know, I was talking about e-commerce. I didn't do e-commerce until about two and a half years ago. Um, somebody came to me and said, well, you know, I need this site. And I thought, well, okay, here I go. I'll try, I'll, I'll try it. Um, I had dabbled in it before. And so I branched out into that. Now, little did I know that now I don't use Joomla as, an e as a uh, shopping cart system any longer. And I don't, that, that's a whole other subject. But um, I learned a heck of a lot by going into that secondary space. And now I can bring it back into my knowledge, my, my toolbox as a freelancer when I'm talking to a, to a company that does sell products. Um, joint associations, jugs, chamber of commerce, and so on, I've done all of those. Um, no longer am I part of a chamber of commerce uh, because I found that that was more time wasted than anything. But meetup.com, which I don't, uh, I don't mention here, is huge. And I went to meetups all over, and some of them, they're trying to sell you something, so you gotta be careful. But there's a lot of people out there in the kind of you know meetup space, meetup world um, that you can meet that are just totally open, learning, ready to to uh, to explore type of folks, um, and then take as much time as possible to consider your first steps. Don't don't just you know I mean one of the things one of the mistakes I've made is when I chose a project thinking yeah that looked good and I jumped right in without really considering what this was going to mean to my career. And there were some real backward steps that I had to take um, and get out of once I made some, some really bad choices. So this is the site I was telling you about. So um, I don't need to go through this, but this site today is still doing well, and we're migrating it to 2.5. We, uh, we had to kind of wait to do that until, until things started rolling on 2.5. Um, this site kind of already went over. Um, so clients that match your, your intentions. Um, another thing is scheduling for optimum performance. Now, um, I used to work more kind of later in the day. Now I work earlier in the day, and, I, I, and that works for me. But it's finding um, what I would call kind of habit, creating positive habits. And Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a Buddhist teacher, he talks about that a lot. Creating positive habits as opposed to negative ones, because if we get into these negative habits, of course, we're just going to be kind of stuck in that, in that mode. So as a freelancer, you have to look for where those positive habits are. And for me, it, wor it, it really helps to be at a co-working space, and I can create those habits. Um, so that, that goes back into office space and active uh, focusing and so on. I could focus for years at home, and I could really get a lot done at home. But I felt like I felt enclosed. I felt kind of. Um, uh, at the end of the day, it was like, well, I'm at home. I'm already here. I'm going to have dinner. Uh, then what? I'm at home. I was at home all the time. I mean, you know, it was like, and so I had to find ways to get out. Um, now that I'm working out of the space, it works. It, it, I'm noticing that my focus is better, that I'm coming home and my, I'm leaving my work behind. And I can actually, uh, my wife is enjoying that more often because I would come home after an intense day and she was. She wouldn't want to be around me. I mean, it was just like, oh my God, you know, this is this is too much. Um, so that makes a big difference. Um, and that's where finding balance is going to be a, a big piece. And I'm going to talk about that when it when it comes to you know how you price what you do and how you charge. And here's another. Here's a quote from uh, from a man who's no longer with us. Um, he lived in Boulder. He started uh, the Naropa Institute and did a whole bunch of work there. Um, so you know, there's. 
I feel like this is the time for Joomla right now with 3.0, that what he's talking about here, where it's a birth of new ideas and ventures with HTML5 and CSS3 coming out. I mean, this is just really a, a kind of a rebirth of Joomla. Um, I think we have to take full advantage of it because, to be honest, from a marketing standpoint, Joomla has dropped in some areas. It's got issues that we need to consider, and that's a whole other subject. But um, I think right now is the time to really, you know, look at how we can flourish as a community. So this goes back into um, into workspace, and one of the things that I talk about here is, you know, natural environments, not artificial. And when I say that is is that I have to go off, and I mentioned birding, it's one of the things I like to do. That helps me to come back into the artificial environment and be able to focus. Um, and birding is actually a lot like uh, web design because you are looking at these little birds sometimes way off in the distance. Um, and then positioning your, yourself for success, and that comes into where you live sometimes. The, the, you know, a big difference living in Vermont, I couldn't command some of the pricing that I, that I have. When I came to San Francisco, just telling somebody I, I, I have an office in downtown San Francisco has upped my, my rates, almost doubled them, you know. Now, when I hire somebody, that's kind of a, you know, if they're working in San Francisco, that's kind of a challenge. Um, and I still do it, and I'll still pay that high rate, but um, there are people in Vermont that might charge less, and I employ them too. So I, I try to kind of keep that balance. So where you live is going to make a difference on that. Okay, so this is kind of the piece. I'm going to go slide right through some, uh, you know, how do I structure this way of doing freelance? And I'll tell you, it's, um, let's see here. Okay. So agreements and engagements. Okay, so for a long time, I, you know, people call it a contract. Ah, uh, we have a contract. Well, I started calling it an engagement letter, an engagement agreement, because really that's what it is. People, there were times when people didn't want to sign contracts at all, or they wanted to change my contract, or they thought it was just all legal stuff. So by calling it an engagement letter, that's what you're doing. You're engaging, and how do we work together? And sometimes, you know what, you have to convince the client to go through this process. When I, when I send uh, an engagement agreement to the client, I go through it step by step because most of them don't read it. They don't look through it all. And when it comes up later on, it's like, remember we talked about that. Remember we went through that. Um, be specific around payments, and, and, you know, and that's the thing. If you think, wow, this client looks great. They look like they're on top of things. But then two months later, you find out, wow, it wasn't. They weren't. And I, I, I forgot to go through this process. And I'll tell you, there's been, just this year alone, I've done about 25 projects. I'd say about half of them have had contractual issues at some point. Something went later. Something went, you know, beyond. Or something even was, uh, was changed along the way. I mean, it, because it's a creative process, things were changing. So that really made a difference. Now, um, this is the top of my contract here, my agreement. I should say, and I call it an, uh, this is a services authorization aspect of it. And this kind of kind of lays some basics out. Um, and, you know, this is a new client uh, in Australia that I have, and basically all I'm telling them is this is what, these are my professional fees, this is where we go, these are the terms. And some, some key aspects to the terms that I use is Making sure that they understand that I'm an independent contractor, that I'm, that I'm a freelancer. Because a lot of them want to treat, treat you like you're an employee. And when you get into the employee and they're, that's, hey, that's, they're, no, they're accustomed to employees. Many of these people that you're going to contract for are accustomed to telling you, like, two months ago I was doing a project and they wanted to go live. They got me the final content at 9 p.m. the night before. They wanted it live. It's by, uh, by, by midnight, three hours later when they got me the content. And the guy just expected, he's, a, he's an MIT grad and all this, he expected that I would get it done and that, of course, stay up all night long to do it, okay? I mean, because I'm an employee of his, in his mind, I, I saw right then, boom, oh, he thinks I'm an employee. Well, guess what? I have a life, you know? So I had to tell, I had to remind him that night at about 9.30 that, you know, I'm not happy about this. And there's a lot of developers I talk to who say, you know what, they weren't willing to say that to the client. But there's times when you've got to get on that phone and you've got to say, you know what, I'm going to stay up till 6 a.m. And I did that night. And we actually didn't go live until 1 in the afternoon the next day because we had to test the website. You know, content just got there the night before. 
So then, um, so that's the one piece you have to help them understand, and sometimes you have to teach them that process. And I've had to spend a lot of time with my long-term clients teaching what that means. Now, ownership rights, um, that's the other piece. Now, I, I got into, I hired somebody who went to Corbis this is a bunch of years ago, downloaded a bunch of images that were not, you know, back then they didn't put these, you know, the um, watermarks on them. Corbis, somebody who, some lawyer found these images a few years later, and all of a sudden they wanted to, you know, sue me for $100,000. That's what they put out there. And then, you know, I didn't have this clause completely clarified. The client um, had sent me some stuff as well that was not legal. So making sure that all, everything that you get and everything that you put on your website is legal and that there's um, everything you do, I, everything I do, I, I give to the client. Now there's some developers who don't do that. Some designers don't do that. I just pass it all off to the client. They're paying for it, I'm giving it to them. Um, and the other thing that I want to talk about here is how do I charge? I found for years that I had this thing, you know, it was, it was there's projects, there's the, you know, the 50% down, you know, usually I do, if I, if I do a large project, yes, it's 50%, 25, 25. But then I was sitting there one time and I was like, God, it's just not working for certain things. It's not working. So now I, I sell blocks of time, especially new clients. If there's a client that comes to you and, and they really want what you do and you are an expert at it, sell them a block of time, 25 hours, 10 hours, whatever. Now, there is some people who are against that. There's some clients who have said, what are you talking about? I, I don't pay until it's done. Well, then you're probably going to have to go elsewhere because that's not how, that's not going to help me. Um, and so I sell blocks of time and sometimes they want, they're willing to do that. Sometimes not. A nonprofit has a real challenge with that sometimes. They'll say, hmm, man, you know, and they'll sit there for a couple weeks and they'll hem and haw and, you know, $900 or $1,000 might be a lot for them. But um, I sell blocks of time and it's made a big difference in, in how I do business. The end of the contract. Who the, the person who's signing might be a different person than who owns the company. So I make sure that all authorizations are done by the, the principal or the person who has, who's got the money strings and so on. So I, I have this personal guarantee that any charges that happen are, are sent directly from the company. Um, okay, so tools of the trade. How much time we got? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to go through this really quick. Um, I use FreshBooks. Anybody use FreshBooks here? Anybody use it? Okay. Anybody never heard of FreshBooks before? Okay, good. Um, because this is cool. I mean, I started using this about a year ago, and FreshBooks is, is awesome. So you can see right here, when I log in, I can see all my active projects, 105 hours. I can see all the analytics on the front page. Um, I can see who, I can even see the clients that logged in that I sent an invoice to. I can see when they logged in, whether they looked at the invoice, and well, let's see, I didn't, they've looked at it 15 times. Why haven't they paid it yet? You know, that's interesting. Um, these are all the projects that I have. Let's see, this is the, these are the clients. So I can create a new client in a matter of minutes. I put in their address, I put in their information, and boom, I'm really off to it. Um, right now, I don't have staff for this. It's a higher rate for the FreshBooks to do a staff. Now, I handle my staff through QuickBooks, so my, um, uh, my bookkeeper will, will handle the staff aspects of things. I do all this um, for my own purposes and in freelancing. Um, and this is a new invoice, so when I if I want to create a new invoice for Landcamer Partners, this is a new project that we're doing um, for Boeing, um, I can do a quick invoice. I can actually have, and I'm sure eBay would be happy about this, that PayPal is completely integrated into FreshBooks. So if I want an online payment, which this is too much, I don't want people to pay through PayPal because it's going to take out a chunk of money, I can click that button and um, the person can pay through PayPal. They get an email when, when this is sent out that says, hey, here, you can view the invoice, blah, blah, blah. They can view it as many times as they want. In fact, if I'm doing a project and I have, um, here's all the invoices right here, and I can kind of look these over, and you can see over here some of them are paid, some of them are viewed. Um, but if I've got a client who wants to see how much I've done this week, they can log in, and this is, you know, some people might want to hide this stuff, but I, I want to be transparent. So 
they can log in and they can see what tasks I did, you know, how much I accomplished this week, and I can make notes on each task. And um, I'll just keep going here. You can do estimates. I don't do it through here, but you can do estimates through here that then can be turned into invoices for deposits. That's a really cool system. And let's see. Tasks. Here we go. You can create as many tasks as you want and include them in every project or not. And so each one of these, when I have a, when I'm doing a, a migration for a client, I can put some notes in there and they're going to see in the invoice what my notes are for that migration. So it might be a specific um, uh, thing that I did for the migration aspect of it. Uh, you can see, this is, this is what I really love about it. You can see over here, these are the estimates of time right here that, uh, of what I think it's going to be, the estimate of time for the project. Or maybe they bought a block of time like these guys. You can see Cubotics. They bought 10 hours, but they, they spent more than, I think it ended up to be 15 or so. So I can see when I come to this page in the end what it is, and then I can edit that and I can send them an invoice for the extra amount. And that's how that works. Um, and then these are all the, r the reports. You can export this to QuickBooks. You can, um, you can see the revenue. You can see the balance sheets. I mean, it's, it's awesome. Uh, you can see what you forgot. I mean, there's some, <laughs> there's some invoices or some uh, clients I forgot that I even spent as much time on them as I, as I thought uh, it would take. So you can see all the reports. Um, Basecamp is another thing I use. Uh, anybody use Basecamp here? OK. Basecamp is, has basically saved me tens of thousands on project management. It is a project manager for me. And base, this is the classic Basecamp here. And what I do, and you can see I have three different clients uh, slash teams that are part of this. Feather River Productions is my company. Landcamer Partners and Nourish Media are, are companies that I work with. And um, I can go between one base camp, so this company owns this section, and I can go. Be I can click the launch pad, and I can go between projects with each one. And this keeps track of every email. So if I get an email from them through this thing, I can delete the email, come back in here, and I can see all the messages. And if a client says, "Yeah, but James, you didn't tell me that blah blah blah," well, I can send them back to base camp that on October second, you bet I told you, and you bet I sent the file, and you bet blah blah blah. So. You know, it, it, it backs you up. And there are people you have to train them again. A client has to be trained to use this. So sometimes they don't, and you have to keep reminding them. It's tricky. This is the new uh, Basecamp version of it. It's, um, uh, it looks a lot like, like a bootstrap site, actually. It might even be. I haven't looked at it, but it could very well be uh, bootstrap based. Um, another tool that I use, and I do because I do a lot of screen screencasts, is Jing. Anybody use Jing out there? Um, Jing is what allowed me to do all of these um, screen captures that you see here. And I can do video. So, um, you know, I did a video for uh, video for Peach Pit Press, the video quick start guide. It was the first video book that they did for Joomla 1.7. And I got to, I, I, I knew this system so well in Jing to be able to do videos for clients that doing the book was really no problem. I could, I could go right in and I could, I could recreate it. So I use Jing. And Jing is basically owned by Screencast. So all of my screencasts and all of my videos are right here. OK, we've got five minutes. Yep. And I can then have folders. I can have different projects uh, that have images, that have tutorials, and so on. It's an awesome, awesome tool. I use it every day. OK, so marketing, networking, expanding. So here's, here's a multi-billionaire Warren Buffett talking about your brand better be delivering something special or it's not going to get the business. And that's, uh, that's really true. Um, Joomla, what's great about Joomla is that it already did a lot of the branding for me. I mean, that's what I love about it in some ways. And so basically, as long as it, as it stays popular enough, I'm going to do well with Joomla. And giving back, I have no problem giving back. I have no problem giving anybody any money for who have done, uh, done work for me. Um, Okay, marketing your uh, journey. I don't have a lot of time here, but what's really helped me is a blog. Um, you know, I told you about the uh, 
the video book that I did, that has been huge. I didn't get paid hardly a thing for that from Peach Pit, but what it has brought was credibility. Um, so when Boeing came to me and they said, you know, hey, well, this developer or whatever, well, but he did a video book. I mean, <laughs> it really wasn't a big deal, but for them, that created merit, so that made a big difference. Um, sustaining good relationships, and that, <laughs> that, is, that can be a challenge, but here's the thing, and here I, I heard a radio talk show host say this, when you're, when you're going up the ladder, you need to be good to the people who are around you because, guess what, you don't know where, when you're going to run into that person again. Because in two years, that person might be the VP at a company you would love to be able to do that website for, and if they find out that you had an argument at some point or whatever, you had a bad relation, it's not gonna happen. So, um, there's a great book that's called um, uh, How to Win Friends and, uh, let's see, and Influence Others, you know, it's been around since, uh, I don't know, the 20s. And um, it's a great book, so if you, if you haven't read it, read it, it's a, it's a wonderful book. We don't have time for this, but what are the, uh, some of the greatest challenges? Um, going back to, I think somebody was talking about, uh, or no, um, you were saying, you know, what do you do about migration and how do you convince the client? Well, here's the thing, is that you, you tell them that no matter what content management system they're using, migration is just a fact of life, and that this is gonna be bigger, better, greater. And showing them the results, that's the key thing. So I, I, I go back to results, because a lot of times as d d designers and developers, we don't get noticed for what we do. So you have to, you have to go through that process. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna go through this, I don't have time to go through some of the challenges there, but proposals. Okay, so proposals, um, I've taken kind of a new route with proposals because I found that the more proposals I do, for some reason, you know, I, I can do a ton of them, and we spend a huge amount of effort on them. It doesn't usually, you know, if they're not accepted, now you've spent all this time on proposals and they're not accepted. So what I do is I give ballparks, I give them a, a break, breakout, uh, what's called an SOW or a scope of work, and I give them a ballpark price. So for the Australia guy, we talked to him and, and we basically said, well, you know, would, uh, I forget how much we quoted, but we threw a number out there, we gave him some points, and he was like, hmm, I'm not sure. Well, he wanted to know more. We didn't even have to do a proposal because we sold him in five days on the price, what he would get in return, and so on. So um, sometimes you, you don't even have to go through this. Now, with Boeing, we had to do a 60-page proposal. And this is part of it right here. I mean, um, website discovery phase is starting in a, you know, two weeks, blah, blah, blah. And we had to break out an entire calendar. And the other day, we, um, we went and we met down here with, um, with the company. And things took off. It was, it was awesome. So uh, this is another part of it. You can break it out. You can bullet it. But how much information you give the client depends. It's going to depend on, on uh, a variety of factors. And I wish I could go into that. Um, I kind of talked about that, but you know, here, here's, here's one piece, and I, I probably have just a few seconds, but specific types of businesses go back into who you are as a person. If you're a person who wants to give back, nonprofit might be a good area, and Joomla, a lot of nonprofits, a lot of governments. Um, I'm a contractor with the San Francisco Department of the Environment, and we did a, there's a huge website that basically tells people uh, what kinds of um, chemicals they can use in their house or in their business, and so, I charge a little less for that. I don't get paid for two to three months, but I love working with, you know, a government agency that's making a difference in people's lives. And it's a, uh, it's in Joomla. It's a, it's a, um, it's something that they are showing other cities. No other city in the country has done anything like this, like San Francisco has. And we get a bad rap for it, but if you go to the website, people see what we're actually doing. They're they're seeing results, and they're seeing that we are creating a site that is making a difference and so that those chemicals aren't ending up in the bay. Because for many years, a lot of those chemicals were going down the toilet, they're going into the bay, and now we have a protocol for how to handle that, what chemicals not to use, because a lot of people just didn't know what that was. So, um, so maybe you're the type of person who likes to work with nonprofits. Integrity business ethics, you know, we, c we don't really have time for that, but um, all of these different subjects are things that as a freelancer, 
you're going to come out to. Now, how do you keep yourself relevant and sustain yourself? Here's, here's a quote from Paul Newman. It kind of talks to this. It also talks to how, you know, we might get, we might get big, we might make a lot of money, but the truth is we're all just farmers living on this planet trying to make everything work the best we can. And that's what I love about the open source community because we're talking about a philosophy of life, a uh, philosophy of sharing that's going to help and sustain everybody. So if Joomla does well, I do well. If I do well, Joomla does well. And, and we've got this basically way to sustain ourselves. So with that said, I want to thank you. And if you have any questions, I will be, uh, I'll be around all weekend long. I'll be, I'm over at the Doubletree. And so you can just catch me and we can talk. So thanks. Thanks for coming.